Okay. It seems to work again for the third session um, on air transport. Uh, the main contents is, uh, is quite simple. It's to describe some of the various segments of the international air cargo industry. To discuss the nature of, uh, of uh, air freight, why it takes place and how air freight rates are determined very shortly. Uh, very shortly. So the reasons are, of course, the faster delivery of perishable products like fashion clothing, newspapers, vegetables, flowers, and so on. Uh, talk actually about lengthening uh, products market life. This is typical examples. If you if you can shorten the transport leg, transport time, you you uh, extend the shelf shelf life of the product. It can be sold, exposed to the customers for a longer duration, longer period of time. Uh, <coughs> So then you can say that transport is, is kind of uh, direct, has a direct influence on the, the market life of the product. Faster delivery of spare parts to minimize downtime. We have some industries in this region which are heavily dependent upon the airport next to, to, to the city to, to transport spare parts and personnel to, to, uh, to do servicing of, uh, of uh, various components, products that they have sold to markets far away, like ships, maybe the prop uh, propulsion systems for ships, and uh, oil and platforms, and so on and so forth. To deliver sp spare parts is important. And then it goes with the other three here, faster delivery of products and services to wider geographical markets. Actually, one of the airlines that uh, was in operation uh, some years back called Broughton's. I, I had nothing to do with it, but it was called Broughton's. They were founded because they were founded by a ship owner to serve his own ships with spare parts. So it was profitable for him to establish an airline actually to serve his own ships with spare parts. The reason was a major engine breakdown in, uh, in a, on a ship way away from, from, from Norway. But of course this business was soon expanded to, to, to passenger transport as well. And that is where the main, let's say, sources of revenue is in the, in the air transport sector is from passengers. But freight is an important uh, part as well, at least in some markets. Faster delivery components from various production size, sites to assembly plant, especially time critic products, high value products, which perhaps doesn't weigh too much, but which is uh, expensive and critical in production. Uh, if you think in terms of service production, this may be medicines from depots or factories and to hospitals or distribution centers for hospitals to get critical. And medicines is a critical factor in, uh, of course, in uh, healthcare service production. It's a way of having an option for flexibility. By uh, because the air freight is very, it's very flexible. It's easy to change from one airport to another, and so on. At least if the aircraft are not too big, so you can you can try to test out certain uh, certain levels of demand. And I mean, the airlines they do that themselves to test markets, not for car for cargo but for passengers. They can test whether it is viable to set up a route from A to B. And if it doesn't provide vi uh, viable, they close it down. And the, the flexibility is high, and the fixed costs, the asset-specific costs connected to that route is modest. So hence, they can be very flexible. And the same can be, uh, can be the situation with freight. But they are, to a larger extent, dependent upon 
equipment that can load and unload uh, aircraft, especially when it comes to, to larger items that are going to be transported. Yeah, to prevent perishability, uh, prevent product obsolescence, meaning that products can soon be outdated. Fashion is one example. Perishability of fruits, vegetables is another. So when you need fast transport of cargo, which doesn't weigh too much, and which preferably is a relatively high value, that's, that's a good thing. Packaging can be an issue. I don't have any good examples, but you can uh, think w if you can just fly it from A to B within a couple of hours instead of having a lot of, let's say, cooling devices. You need to shift from one uh, transport carrier to another along the, along the transport chain. Instead of that, you can just use air freight and just go from A to B, more or less. Uh, frictionless is, is one, one thing. And higher insurance costs could apply if you need a long transport chain crossing a lot of borders. That can have an impact on, on insurance costs as compared to a situation where you just fly from point to point then you don't have the border crossing issue at all. Coordination issues, less of an issue, the coordination of documentation, but there is still an, there is still an issue connected to that. Um, inconvenient or unpredictable alternative transport chains may also be a reason for choosing air freight in some cases. Perhaps not a very big issue, but anyway. It's the high-end cargo market that we are talking about here, the high-value cargo. Even flowers that is taken in from, from Africa and sold in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe are characterized here as high-value cargo. They are reasonably expensive and they don't weigh too much. More than half of the cargo transported is, is belly freight. We call it belly freight. When they use the, the cargo compartment in the belly of the aircraft, passenger aircraft, to transport cargo. So, so that is, uh, that is uh, let's say, the most common way of, of uh, doing air freight. When you have mixed passenger cargo air carriers, that is what I said earlier, 70% of the revenues comes from passenger passengers. So that, in that combined cargo passenger freight uh, business, uh, the passengers are the main, the main sources of revenue. Strong growth, around 8% during the last decade, whereas we have seen 1% to 2% on passenger output. But this is, so we can say that freight by air is a kind of an income elastic business which means that when the when the global economy is doing well when you have a steady economic growth air transport is growing even stronger and also the covariance between business cycles and passenger transport is quite strong and passenger transport seen in connection with business cycles is also positively correlated in the sense that uh, passenger transport tend to grow a bit more than the growth in, uh, in let's say, GDP, uh, let's say, between two countries. So passenger transport is also an income elastic uh, phenomenon, but, but uh, air freight even more so. That can be useful when you are when if you are going to say forecast the growth in the air cargo transport. It can be useful to compare it with the with the development in business cycles, 
between, let's say, two trading partners, and then uh, try to work out some uh, some forecasts on on future growth. So this is basically illustrating what I'm I'm saying here. Freight <coughs> is growing stronger than passenger transport, and uh, there was a setback here, and you see that the setback here. Guess what year? 2008, the credit crunch, the global credit crunch. The setback was stronger for freight than for passengers. You see that from the numbers here. And that is illustrating the point that I made, that it is more income elastic than passenger transport. Major flows. From uh, you see that Asia Pacific as the as one main center, Europe, and and then not to forget North America, which is uh, which is attracting quite a lot of, of cargo in measured in ton kilometers. Uh, the larger markets here, and you have the the export, and you have the import. It's fairly balanced between Europe and Asia Pacific, but it's strongly in favor of export towards North America. So North America is importing a lot more than of air freight services than they export to, to the Far East. From Europe, <coughs> there is an export, not too bad balance, but there is a, a slight this uh, imbalance in favor of uh, exports. They are exporting more than they import from the, from the US. Balance between Africa, this is in terms of, uh, of volumes. Um, the main intake from Africa is, is uh, perishable food and, uh, and flowers and things like that. You have also trade going between Latin America and, uh, and, and North, North America. And I'm not going to discuss anything connected to the drug traffic in that respect. A lot of that goes by air, but not, it's not a part of this statistics, anyway. The larger freight airlines, which is uh, dealing with both specialized freighters and uh, combined freight with passenger transport. Uh, these are all airlines that are doing combined businesses. But when you come here to the big ones, the big air freighters are, have specialized in, the, in uh, commercial freighters, aircraft that is dedicated for freight. They also use some belly freight from time to time. Um, with that, I mean combined with passenger transport, but mostly the larger parts of the flows by UPS and, uh, and uh, Federal Ex Express are made by specialized aircraft. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about this, but also you should be aware of that there are quite a lot of the quite a lot of the volumes which is called air freight, it's actually going by road. Because <coughs> they, you may order a service, delivered an item uh, at a specific time in a specific country, let's say in Europe, from Norway, from the Oslo area. And, uh, and since the driving distances are so short, they guarantee a delivery within a so, uh, in a certain and presumably a quite short uh, time span. But if they manage to do it by, by truck, they may actually use trucks. Because, I mean, the, the, the customer doesn't care about uh, what kind of transport that it uses as long as it is, is at the destination on time. But you don't, I don't need, I will not go into detail on that, but there, are, there is, some of these ton kilometers that are assigned as air freight is actually transported by, by road in some, in some uh, 
in some circumstances with a short distance, but where you can guarantee a sh also a short lead time on the road. This is the 10 years ago. It has grown since then, but uh, the distribution is not has not changed much, so it's still quite quite valid. Uh, capital equipment, uh, intermediate ma materials, which is supplies to to to, uh, to a production activity, uh, perishables, vegetables, flowers, and so on, computers, apparel, which is clothing, fashion clothing, for instance. And then you have a lot of uh, a residual, which is a composition of, of other. I would have seen, if you are, let's say, going to write a thesis at some point in time, it is never good to have the category other as a very big part of a pie like this. So you should be able to categorize it better than this, uh, if possible. Presumably or probably the other category here it's consists of a lot of sectors. So they haven't been able to be more precise than that. This is quality factors that are considered as important by freight operators. Not only quality factors, but also, uh, let's say, factors connected to operations and infrastructure availability, like being able to land and take off at night is important for, for many, uh, many aircraft operators. Just make sure that the sound works. Uh, because many airports have, uh, have banned flights during nighttime, and many of the large freighters, freight aircraft, they produce a lot of noise. And that is one of the reasons why this operation, has, this limitation has, has come around. But it's important for, for the freight operators to have flexibility also during nighttime. Cost minimization is, is, of course, an issue. Reputation is an issue with respect to noise, energy use, and so on. Uh, whether it is, whether the, actually the flows and the demand for flows are, are uh, suitable for air, air, air freight uh, as, a, as a mode. Collaboration with uh, an influence on freight forwarders. Airport road access is important, of course, because you need, you need feeding services. And then you have uh, lead time issues, custom clearance. Financial incentives and tracking time to main markets, and this goes together with what I said that s at some on some occasions they use trucks instead of aircraft for air transport. It's a paradox, but that's the way it is. So, this is on a scale from one to five. This is the m these are the most important issues. Um, secondary airports with little congestion not much pressure on, pressure on slot times, located not too far from uh, big concentration of people, may be, uh, may be uh, good cases for, uh, to be served by air freight. Uh, because of, uh, and they shouldn't be located too close to where people live because of the noise and the other issues, of course. But in most cases, you, you don't have many specialized airports for freight only. Normally, freight is a part of, uh, of an ordinary uh, conventional airport services. Just check again. Yes. Yeah. Types of aircraft in this, uh, in this business. Uh, we have, we'll touch upon this, two basic types, one combined with the passenger transport and
you see a container here, which is then used uh, as a load carrier, but it is placed in the belly of a passenger aircraft. So even in a combination with passengers, you can use containers. And the shape of the container is, is adapted. You see the kinked uh, angle here to fit with the shape of the body of the aircraft, to utilize the, the space efficiently. And in many cases, air freight is lightweight. So volume may be the limiting factor and not the weight itself to, to let's say, to use the, the payload, the maximum payload efficiently. You need to be uh, efficient on, uh, on space allocation. Air freighters may be regularly scheduled air services uh, and not uh, not the room for passengers could also be ill, Ill, irregular that they are used on speci specific occasions. And we have a tragic <coughs> event that happened uh, a couple of days ago uh, ago at the Philippines with this disaster because of the typhoon, the wind, strong wind, and then. There are lots of air freight involved, indeed not on a regular basis. That is a kind of a spot market event. You need a lot of capacity during a very short life, uh, time span. And that has proven in some cases to be difficult, that are, there are not that many big air freighters, air, air, aircraft around, to serve such peaks in demand. That was a problem when we had, it means like G here, cargo, uh, when we had this, uh, this uh, tsunami event in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Thailand uh, some 10 years ago. And I don't know how the situation is now, but, uh, but uh, the, the demand is probably, or it will be in the coming days or weeks, uh, substantial. The whole aircraft is carrying cargo. They may use available slots that are not that demanded, uh, where the demand is not that high from passenger traffic. So it's in the middle of the day where the traffic, passenger traffic is not that high because that is concentrated in the morning and afternoon peaks. During nighttime, during weekends. Uh, so there is, there are certain differences. You can have a charter airplane, as I, as I said, not regular. This is the, let's say, a single voyage or a set of voyages for a limited period of time. It may be under, under a wet lease or a dry lease. A wet lease is uh, used for short-term leasing. Then you, then you actually hire an aircraft with crew and fuel and everything for a, for a limited operation. So this is provided uh, and, uh, and uh, so, so the wet lease is, is a complete aircraft with staff. In some cases also covers everything like uh, fuel and insurance fees. In other cases, some of this may be covered by the, by the part that leases the aircraft. But that's not important. The dry lease is more where you, <coughs> where you lease the aircraft, but where you take care of crew, crewing the aircraft, setting up with the uh, manning the aircraft and, uh, and taking care of everything apart from just the physical unit, the aircraft. So many of the bigger airlines like uh, SAS Norwegian, they dry lease aircraft. They don't own the aircraft, even if they say that, well, we have bought 200 new aircraft. In, in reality, m many of those aircraft are leased aircraft with, with leasing agreements for a, for a, for a period of time. It, and that period may be quite, quite long.
uh, charter airlines, uh, charter air aircraft services uh, may have to do with uh, seasonal fluctuations that it can take out the peaks of demand and it can be served by a flexible uh, air transport service. In some cases, there are some, some examples here. Or it may be due to a uh, large increase in, uh, in sales, or it may be due to catastrophes like we see now. Uh, so it's uh, also tailor-made aircraft that can be used to serve specific needs, like uh, military equipment and uh, humanitarian logistics equipment and so on. So this is an example of a, of a very big, <coughs> big aircraft, uh, which is an Airbus uh, air aircraft that can, can take quite a lot of, of volume. It reflects actually what I said, that volume is the issue, because there are light, lightweight uh, cargo that we are dealing with here. Lightweight, high value. You don't need <coughs> this volume if you are going to, to transport heavy equipment, like for instance military equipment. You can even like when, when you man the armed forces in, uh, in Lebanon or, uh, or Afghanistan or whatever, wherever, <coughs> you, you, you need a lot of heavy equipment, heavy military equipment, and then you will use another type of freighter than this, with not so much volume, because they are much more focused on weight. Yeah, this is just uh, another picture <coughs> where you can you can lift uh, the back of the aircraft to load very, very big, very big equipment here. This is a Russian aircraft, and that may be, for instance, uh, connected to military operations. So the body is not as wide on that one as on, on this one, but the, the carrying capacity is, is, is much higher. So we are dependent on high load factor. To, to make profits here. So, and you need to have a kind of a good balanced uh, flow so that the, the direction of balance is good. You cannot, it's very expensive to set up an air freight service with empty repositioning. If you fly empty back, you lose a lot of money. And that's uh, why, uh, let's say, the combined passenger air freight business is very attractive when you, when you have, have that kind of flexibility. But of course, in some cases, you just need to, to, to take the costs of a one-way uh, with a bad or less favorable direction of balance, for instance, connected to, to natural disasters and catastrophes and so on. A quite diversified industry with smaller freighters, larger freighters. If some, if some of you use aircraft, uh, air transport from this airport nearby, Molde here, you will see a small aircraft standing there during daytime. Which, and the purpose of that aircraft is to carry, uh, is to serve the postal services. So that aircraft used to be a 50-seater aircraft, which is converted to a, to a, to a freighter and they are used for, for postal services. In earlier days, and I think that happens still, is to convert passenger aircraft to freight aircraft when they reach their end of their life cycle as a passenger aircraft. Because uh, freight aircrafts are not that, uh, there are some factors connected to to, to safety issues and so on, which are a bit more, it's, it's, uh, it's not that strict when you are dealing with, uh, with, uh, with freight as, as pas passengers, sorry. But uh, 
they are operating in quite strict conditions, but they are slightly different, slightly different. So specialized types. Those of you who have, might have been in the army may have seen this, the Hercules, a big f freighter uh, designed for uh, transporting uh, material for the defense. Can take about 25 tons, this is quite a lot. And then can land and take off from, uh, from, a very from remote areas with, uh, with rough surfaces. This is the biggest one around. Can carry 250 tons in, in total. And it's rather, uh, it, this is a Jumbo jet. And it's, uh, it's a little less than twice as, as big uh, as, a, as a Jumbo in terms of uh, carrying capacity. Or start weight. So it's big. Looks like this. With six engines and, uh, and you see a lot of, of main landing wheels here. Which says something about the carrying capacity. Actually, in hot summer days, you need to keep those aircraft moving when they are standing on the gro ground fully loaded. Because if you don't move them on the, on the tarmac of the airport, the wheels are setting themselves. They are digging themselves down in the tarmac. So we need to keep them moving slowly all the time. So they are very, very heavy. And this is the, the, the one that I showed you with this big freight compartment. And it's uh, made in Europe, uh, an Airbus template. Airbus is a multinational company located in Toulouse in France. And then take, they take parts from all over the place in, in, in Europe, from the UK, from Germany, and so on and so forth. So it looks like this. It doesn't look too nice, I think. It looks like a whale or something. But it's uh, still uh, it's still widely used for for big voluminous uh, freights. Containers, <coughs> as I said, the uh, the whole cargo containers are called unit load devices (ULD) for short. Made of light materials to be able to take uh, to to maximize the the payload of the aircraft. The, the utilization rate assigned to cargo and not to uh, not to boxes, designed to fit the curves of the of the aircraft. So you have many different types depending on the aircraft and uh, and the location in the aircraft and so on. The biggest one is fairly uh, similar to the TEU or the TU container or ISO container, but it weights less because of the materials. So, as I said, it's, uh, air transport is quite, quite commonly used in, uh, in, uh, in the small packages uh, business because of uh, the short lead time and the simply, the, the simply clearance and documentation issues. It's easier to track and trace and so on. You see that all over the place. I mean, most internet trade, at least the, the international internet trade, is dependent on, uh, on Air Express services, in many cases. Uh, and of course, you need consolidators like DHL, FedEx, UPS to consolidate to, to maximize the utilization rate of the, of the aircraft. So they charge these Air Express company. They charter small aircraft to fly at night, uh, and also to, to have contracts with the with the feeding feeding business uh, industry, trucks del del delivery and pickup. Couriers. They are more aimed at specific tasks to go with one specific item from one place to another. And, uh, 
and uh, if you want to deliver a specific, let's say, a document at at a destination at a specific time, you are uh, engaging into courier services. So when we are going to, let's say, submit a tender to the Ministry of Transport and Communication in Oslo, we are tendering for a project, let's say, to analyze uh, a new road project or whatever. And if the deadline for that tender is set, and we are late, so that we cannot use the, the conventional, po conventional postal service, we need to use a courier service. And then they guarantee that the letter with the, t with the tender documents are delivered at the address at a specific time. And they, uh, they track and trace and they feed back to, the, to, to us as customers that it actually has been delivered. So that is a courier service. It follows a certain shipment from origin to destination. Airmail, <coughs> commonly used. Don't, uh, don't say more about that. Forwarders are uh, more or less in the same position as forwarders and consolidators in the, in the land surface transport, sea rail air, nice sea rail uh, road transport. We call that surface transport. And they, uh, they, uh, they are often, they are comparable to, 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 uh, to the forwarders in the, in the surface transport business. Carries the risk of loss and damage, of course they, they insure themselves against that, and that insurance premium is, is uh, paid by the, by the customer, eventually. Rates. It's a very diversified picture. It's not easy to give a, a very shorthand version of how to set rates. They are often set uh, in, in accordance with uh, or uh, from analysis of market segmentation, willingness to pay in various market segments, and so on. Uh, it used to be a situation where the International Air Transport Association had an active role in setting the charges. That is not the case anymore. You cannot, there, there is a liberalization of tariffs. You are not allowed to cooperate on tariffs anymore because that, are, uh, that is cartels, which is not a good thing. Uh, so in principle, <coughs> they, are, they may be, uh, be uh, sold to the highest offer or uh, according to a price list set on various criteria connected to experiences with willingness to pay in different markets. So we have certain types of, uh, of rates related to weight uh, and so on. Different, uh, you may have uh, Specific commodity rate, you give discounts in off-peak periods, perhaps they uh, improve the direction of balance. Uh, you may have specific rates for containers. You may have class rates for goods that require special treatment, often more expensive, of course. And contract rates for a given contract for a given period of time. So there are lots of, lots of uh, types. I'm just going to finish <coughs> by showing a small example of how you can think of a thinking, a way of thinking when you determine rates of a shipment with air. So cargo of low, den low density uh, will fill up the space for cargo before its lifting capacity is reached. Meaning that if you have lightweight cargo, the space is the limiting factor. And based on average numbers, the average ideal density, that was actually, the th that was uh, at least the truth uh, some, some years ago, the average ideal density for air cargo was equal to 166.67 kilo per cubic meter. Because that is, where you have the trade-off between space 
and lifting capacity is where the weight of one cubic meter is 166.67 kilo. And you understand that easily, that this will vary between aircraft. So this is an example. So density is the mass divided by volume. The density for water is one. It's defined as one. So one liter of water is equal to one kilo of water. Liter, uh, one liter of water weighs one kilo. The density for concrete is 2.5 kilos per, uh, per, uh, per uh, liter, if you like. So, <coughs> cargo weighing one kilo should ideally have a volume of 0 0.0060 cubic meter, or 6,000 cubic centimeter which is equal to six liters. So this is simply a simple derivation of this, of this number. So this is simply derived from one specific aircraft with one s available space of the, of the cargo compartment. And, a, and a, specific, uh, a specific capacity in terms of carrying capacity, how many tons it can lift. And then you get the ideal density is 166.67. Then you get a full aircraft with, with, the, with the maximum payload that you can have in the aircraft. So then, uh, how do you solve the problem if, if the cargo de is deviating from this ideal measure of 166.67 kilo per, per uh, cubic meter? So you need to do some corrections. So if the density of cargo is lower than the ideal density, then you don't care about the volume, right? Because then the, the carrying capacity, the weight, will be, uh, no, sorry, if the, if, the cargo is, if the density is lower, then you need to carry about the space and not so much about the volume. So <coughs> uh, if the dimensional weight is, uh, is uh, then the dimensional weight is the actual volume of, of cargo divided by 6,000 in this case. If the density of cargo is higher than the ideal density, this is if the, the density of the cargo is lower, meaning lighter than the ideal density, then we need to correct. If the chargeable weight, if the density of the cargo is higher than ideal density, meaning that it is heavier than the ideal cargo, then you can just uh, focus on the weight. You don't need to focus on the volume. And then you just ch charge according to weight. So if you have a situation where, the, where, the, where you have li lightweight cargo, the cargo is weighing less per, uh, per uh, volume unit than the ideal weight, we can take this example. You have a shipment of uh, a box 20 times 30 times 50 uh, centimeters has a weight of 2.5 kilos. It's a Christmas present that you're going to send to somebody. So the volume <coughs> is 30,000 cubic centimeter, 0 0.03 cubic meter. It's a simple um, multiplication of these three to get the volume. The density here, you know the weight is 2.5. The, the cubic meter is, uh, is 0 0.03 as a result of this multiplication. And you get the density then as uh, 83.3 kilo per cubic meter. So it's light and it's half the weight of the ideal cargo. In the ideal cargo in terms of weight per volume unit. So what you do here is to say that if you have decided 
what charge you need for a fully laden aircraft in terms of weight, the maximum carrying weight that you need to go in, uh, go break even or to earn a uh, certain amount of money according to, let's say, the market's willingness to pay for a fully laden aircraft in terms of weight, that you use the weight fully. This box with half the weight of the ideal weight should then be charged according to the double weight of its ac actual weight. So we charge as if it weighs five kilos because, uh, because it, it's, uh, that box will contribute to filling the aircraft with lightweight cargo. And if you have only boxes like that, you would, you would lose money if you charge according to weight. You need to take the volume into consideration as a dimensioning factor, and you need to double the charge, actually, because it weights only half of what is ideal per volume unit. So the chargeable weight is double, five kilos, not two and a half kilos. The density of the shipment is half of the ideal, therefore its chargeable weight is twice its actual weight. So that's a that's one way of dealing with lightweight cargo when we are going to, to set the charges. All right, so that was it. It's, uh, it's a lot more to be said about air freight, but uh, hopefully some issues have been touched upon here. And uh, together with the book chapter, this, these lecture notes should just provide you with, uh, with uh, sufficient information to, to survive the exam. So, thank you. <laughs>